Greetings and welcome to this uh, interview, which is another part of the Kansas Oral History Project. It's being done under the auspices of that project. It is a uh, 501c3 program, which is designed to collect and preserve for future historians and citizens um, the work of uh, people who have been in very influential and prominent in Kansas uh, government. And we're here today. Uh, it is uh, January 28. Uh, 2023 on the ranch farm of uh, Joe Hoagland uh, and his wife Norma is here and uh, we are uh, going to be talking about Joe's career both in the legislature as an international businessman, a very innovative uh, person as far as the uh, uh, resources around the world and his impact on uh, international uh, commerce uh, and the, the cattle industry writ large. But uh, we're going to spend a lot of time focusing on Joe's involvement during the 1970s and 1980s in the legislature, uh, and uh, because a lot of important things happened during that period of time, and Joe was a major player in so much of it. My name is Richard Walker. I'm a senior judge uh, of, for, for the state of Kansas, and Joe and I have just been talking. We've known each other uh, over 50 years and worked together, but the focus today is going to be on uh, Joe's efforts uh, during that period of time. So. Joe, welcome to the interview process. We appreciate you making your home available to us today. To, well, thank to you. Thank you, Richard, and congratulations to you on your selection as the president of the State Historical Society. That's quite well, that's, a, that's mostly because I've been there 20 years and they ran out of uh, people to do it. It's uh, very deserving. <laughs> well, we're here to talk about uh, your major involvement in the events of Kansas government over a, a period of uh, nearly 20 years. And so, but the first thing we want to talk about is your background. Uh, tell us a little bit about where you were born, your early education, your college uh, uh, involvement, because you, I think, have sure. a family connection to Tulane University. And why don't you tell us about uh, uh, your early beginnings? Yeah, I'd be happy to. My, um, my family's one of the oldest families in America. We came from Holland 13 generations ago. I'm the 13th generation. Uh, when Henry Hudson uh, uh, discovered the uh, Hudson River and founded the colony, Dutch colony of New Amsterdam at the foot of Manhattan Island. Uh, in fact, I'm a direct descendant of the first white child born in New York. Uh, wow. But uh, our family came to Kansas uh, following the passage of the Kansas-Nebraska Act and 1854. They were abolitionists and they came here to vote Kansas in as a free state and they settled between Topeka and Lecompton and uh, that's uh, that's kind of uh, how my family got to Kansas. We still own some land that's been in the family in, in that area uh, ever since then. So um, I um, grew up uh, in uh, Kansas City. Uh, my father was the fourth generation of our family to own and operate our family business. It was started by my great-grand-uncle as a general merchandise store at the corner of 5th and Main Street in Kansas City, which was down close to the river. The city hall at that time was directly across the street, so the whole center of the city, much smaller, much closer to the river. And there were people coming through Kansas City to set up wagon trains and start moving west on the Oregon and the Santa Fe trails and he supplied them with things that they would need and so it was a general merchandise store my uh, great-grandfather ran it my grandfather my father ran the company by the time my father ran it we had uh, five retail stores in the Kansas City area and we also supplied uh, products to restaurants and hotels uh, for their uh, kitchens, uh, things like glassware, chinaware, cutlery. And at that time, when my father was starting this after, well, he took over the company in 1937 and ran it, except for the time that he was in the Navy during World War II and then came back. He uh, two uh, commercial airlines were starting up in Kansas City, Braniff and Transworld Airlines. And they were sort of like another restaurant. Their food service in flight was uh, just like another restaurant or hotel that was his customer base. 
So uh, he started supplying airlines, and um, that became a big focus of, of the business. And uh, we can get into that in more detail if you'd like. But, but that's what the company does today. It's being run uh, today by my oldest daughter. And that would be the sixth generation of the family to own and operate the same company. Okay. So you graduated from high school in the Kansas City area? Graduated from Shawnee Mission West, um, went to Tulane University. and uh, Why there? I mean, uh, well, it, uh, you know, it's an elite private school. Um, I wanted to go out of state to school. I was vice president of the student body and done well in high school and, and uh, you know, had a, um, a resume to get accepted at at school like that and so I applied there we'd had family members go there and uh, had that connection with Tulane it was uh, but my plan was always to come back home uh, to okay. Kansas all right got back home and then you kind of start your journey in politics why don't you talk a little bit about well, that my uh, it was uh, not immediate I, I came back and wanted to do something after I graduated and, and I had some fraternity brothers that were active in politics. Jim Francis was involved in uh, George Bush's campaign for Congress in the uh, Houston area at the time. This was in 1970. And um, so they were taking jobs in the summer working political campaign. So I thought I would do that before I started my, my career. And uh, that's when we met working in Kent Frizzell's campaign for governor in 1970. But unsuccessful campaign. <laughs> unsuccessful campaign. We can talk about why that was, but uh, needless to say, uh, Bob Docking was running for a third term, and uh, he was very popular following his property tax uh, as governor lid yeah. that he proposed as governor. But uh, yeah, that's right. And at the same time, then uh, law school at uh, at KU. Well, I I had planned to go to work for the family business. That was always my destiny. I had applied to law school as about every graduating senior had done some kind of postgraduate work at the time. Uh, there was a, at the time I applied to grad school and to law school, it was a way to um, defer military service. That went away by the time I graduated. But So I had been accepted to graduate business school, I had been accepted to law school, but I didn't really plan to go. I wanted to go back into the family business, so I came home, uh, went to work with my, my father, uh, basically was given the same job I had when I was in high school, back in the freight room preparing shipments and things, and I went to him, I said, Dad, you know, I just graduated near the top of my class from this elite private school, uh, and I was president of my fraternity, uh, I'd like a little more responsibility, and he said, well, you've got to work your way up. And we got in an argument, and I decided, well, I'm just going to go to law school. And he said, well, you can, but I'm not going to pay for it. And, of course, he'd paid for everything in all my <laughs> life before. But I had some money that I'd saved from summer jobs and things. I had enough money to start law school, at least. So, so that's how I ended up going to law school, was a result of uh, my argument with my father. And you and I share the same experience of running, uh, being law students, and uh, campaigning uh, in 1972 for the Kansas House of Representatives. Well, I, I have to admit, I followed in your <laughs> shoes. We, uh, you and I took a class together from Barclay Clark, who was a professor at the law school and had also been the mayor of uh, Lawrence. He was a very politically active guy, and he taught a class in statutory construction, which is the language of statutory law as opposed to uh, contract law and, and civil matters. This was how to write laws for, for statutes. And uh, we did an internship as part of that class, and both of us worked in the 72 session uh, for some state senators. I think you worked for Joe Harder, I worked for Norm Gar, But uh, uh, that kind of... Uh, got me interested in the legislature, but you were the one that decided you would run for the legislature. And that had never occurred to me, but I immediately thought that would be a good way for me to make money. 
<laughs> and be able to pay for law school because At ten dollars a day. <laughs> legislators got ten dollars a day and twenty five dollars a day expenses, and my rent for my apartment in Lawrence was only sixty five dollars a month. So, so I kind of did what you did. We we met with Paul Hess, who had run, been elected in nineteen seventy, was a prolific vote getter. Uh, and uh, had a formula for getting elected, and he taught you, and I copied what what he taught you to do in terms of campaigning. And uh, he had run then the next year, and when we were running in 1972, he'd run for the state senate, got elected, and ran his wife for the house seat that he was leaving, and she got elected. So he was a very successful campaigner, and he kind of gave us a roadmap to follow, and and I did basically what you did. I ran against an incumbent. You ran against a 20-year incumbent. My incumbent was not that. He'd been there six years or something. But we and we both won. And we were we were kind of a generational change. There were a few young legislators uh, that had been elected before. R. H. Miller was elected in 1970. Dave Heineman was elected, I think, in '68. But there were very few baby boomers in the state legislature. But in our class in 72, there were a number. Uh, and uh, uh, Sandy Duncan from Wichita, uh, Neil Whitaker from Wichita, uh, yourself, myself. And then the following year, there were more coming along. And it kind of became a, a, a generational transition uh, because prior to that, all the people uh, that served in the legislature were, uh, many of them were World War II veterans. There were very few women. I think there were only two uh, in that 72 session that were we, when we interned. Um, and uh, that, was a, that was a big change. And that change became more evident uh, as we served. Why don't you talk about the, the genesis of the efforts to try to broaden things beyond uh, uh, the old timers that kind of coalesced in support for Wendell Lady as a speaker. Well, in the House. We, <laughs> we, we had a, uh, a group of kind of a, I had, I had learned from Wendell, uh, who was a mentor to me. His, his house was only a couple blocks from my house. I was in the southern part of my legislative district. He was in the northern part, but we were both from Overland Park. Our constituents were very similar. And he had worked, starting when he was elected in 68, to change the formula for the distribution of the state uh, gasoline tax. Instead of distributing based on lane miles to counties, he wanted to have it distributed based on population so that more money from the gasoline tax would go to the cities and less to rural farm-to-market roads. Started the initial clash of rural urban legislators. He was very urban. But he was successful because he started these urban study groups. And he and Pete Locks, who was the uh, minority leader at the time, uh, would meet uh, in the evenings and formulate strategies on how to advance a more urban agenda. Pete from Wichita. Pete so. Locks from Wichita, Kansas, right. And uh, um, that's essentially, when, when I got to the legislature with these younger guys, that's kind of what we started to do. And I remember the first group was uh, R.H. Miller, uh, who had already served one term, uh, you and I and Neil Whitaker from Wichita and Sandy Duncan. And Sandy coined a term for us, uh, for our little meetings, as the meetings of the young energetic legislative leaders out to win, which went by the an acronym YELLOW, because we, you know, we talked big, but we were <laughs> terrified. So uh, uh, over a period of time, we expanded that group. And uh, it, uh, my, it, in my second term, my roommate was Mike Hayden, who later became Speaker of the House and Governor. And he, uh, uh, I remember I would go to these breakfast meetings, leave at 7 o'clock, go, where are you going? 
oh, I've got this meeting to go to, or I'm, at night, you know, well, let's watch TV while I've got a meeting to go to. So finally, I just started bringing him to the, to the meetings. There were other people that started coming to those. Some of the guys elected in the following term, like Fred Lorenz, who became a district court judge in uh, Fredonia, uh, uh, started meeting and we expanded that group. And as we, we all wanted more authority, more uh, political power than we had, the, the power was controlled by the prior generation, America's greatest generation, right? The generation that won World War II. Everybody was a veteran. Uh, but Wendell Lady was moving up in the leadership. He, he was competent. He was a civil engineer. Uh, he managed a very complex projects for Black & Beach, which was a nationally prominent uh, engineering firm uh, designing wastewater treatment facilities around the country. And uh, he was picked by Pete McGill, to Pete McGill's credit, to be chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, which was a, which was a leadership spot for sure, and um, handled all the appropriations. And we wanted to get behind him because he was the first uh, person in leadership at that time that had not been a veteran of World War II or the Korean War. He'd never been a veteran and was kind of in that sandwich generation, a little bit older than us, but not too much. And we could get behind him and push him for leadership. And if he got in, then he would put us in positions of authority. And that's essentially what happened. We, uh, I became Mike Hayden became chairman of Ways and Means over Bill Bunton, who was uh, on Ways and Means Committee from Topeka, had been the vice chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, but Wendell was loyal to these young guys that got him elected, put Mike in as, as chairman of Ways and Means, put me in as judiciary chairman, put Neil Whitaker in as chairman of federal, federal and state affairs. So uh, it... Uh, um, that's how we kind of wrestled control of the legislature away from, from the older guys. Since most people probably don't know this and since we lived through it, why don't you talk about the major change that occurred in 76 and then the transition back and your role in the transition back in 78 uh, onward? Well, 76 was a pivotal year. Uh, I remember the Watergate hearings, uh, Richard Nixon uh, on the verge of impeachment resigns, Gerald Ford uh, is vice president, becomes president of the United States and uh, pardons Nixon for his uh, role in Watergate and the whole uh, uh, event. And Republicans were incredibly unpopular as a re result of that. And I remember in the 76 election, taking the word re-elect off my yard signs and just putting elect. I, I took the word Republican off my yard signs and, and uh, a number, well, we lost control of the Kansas House that election. Um, Jimmy Carter was elected president, uh, beating Gerald Ford. Um, the Senate held on to a Republican majority, I think, by one vote. So it was a real sea change of uh, leadership. Uh, Pete Lux had been appointed by Bob Bennett to chair the Corporation Commission, so Pete had left and a, the young uh, assistant floor leader, John Carlin, had uh, came in to take, uh, take his place and then John Carlin moved up to speaker from being the minority leader when the Democrats took control. And used that as a launching pad, a, a bigger run, political career. Governor, absolutely. So became governor after that. Okay, that lasted for a couple of years. Then starting in 78, uh, you began to assume a much, uh, much larger legislative role. Well, I, I chaired the Judiciary Committee. Uh, when In 78, when the Republicans got con majority control back. Uh, and then Wendell we, became Speaker, Wendell right? Wendell became Speaker. He was Minority Leader. He became Speaker. And uh, um, I became 
uh, chairman of the Judiciary Committee. It's interesting when you go back and look at that group of people that were members of Yellow. Um, there were four future speakers in that group. There were five future floor leaders in that group. There was a congressman, Bob Whitaker, from southeast Kansas. There was a governor, Mike Hayden, became governor. And there were uh, two district court judges, yourself and Fred Lorenz. It was an amazing group of talent that we had assembled that, uh, that propelled that change. Then you uh, took on an even larger role, uh, starting, uh, what, in 1980? Uh, I was, I was uh, chairman of the Judiciary Committee for Wendell's term as Speaker okay. of the House. And he was uh, Speaker for four years. That right. was the tradition. You served two terms as Speaker and then would step down. Um, one of the... Um, so, um, Wendell uh, then decided to run for governor, um, and uh, Mike Hayden ran for speaker. I ran for majority floor leader at that point in time. And, and you were involved with some pretty major pieces of uh, legislation. Um, why don't you list two or three of the things you view as some of the most significant legislative accomplishments when you were in a position essentially to control a lot of the uh, floor activity? Well, there. Uh, there were one of the things that was interesting that we take for granted today was the 911 emergency phone system. Uh, the that was before the deregulation of the mm -hmm. telephone industry. It was Ma Bell, which was regulated by the Corporation Commission for telephone rates and everything else. And to be able to set up a emergency phone number the same as the information number, which was 411. They needed uh, governmental approval to be able to do that, to offer that product. So they came up with this idea of a emergency phone number that people could dial. It would be so simple that even a four-year-old could dial 911 if it was necessary, and there have been stories of that actually happening. But at the time, that was actually a controversial piece of legislation. It was introduced in the Senate. Jan Myers, who was a state uh, senator at that time, became a United States uh, a member of Congress, um, carried the bill on the floor of the Senate. It got through, but not with a <laughs> strong vote, and uh, got to the House side. And uh, uh, Ed Schaub, who was the lobbyist for Southwestern Bell, wanted me to carry it on the floor of the House because there was a lot of opposition in our home county of Johnson County, which was suburban, surrounded by a whole bunch of small municipalities. These municipalities did not want to give up their control over the dispatch of their fire department and their police department. And they opposed it. The League of Municipalities and Ernie Mosier, who was the lobbyist for the League of Municipalities, was, was in opposition, had too many uh, urban uh, cities that, that didn't want to have that central dispatch. And uh, um, that, uh, we got it through, it, it passed, and I remember Ed Schaub coming to me afterwards, and, and he was a magnificent uh, lobbyist. He, he knew everybody in the legislature, sure. had taken everybody to lunch at least once, <laughs> and, you know, he could call in a lot of chips, and it was more his work than my skill on floor debate and getting it through, but we, we did get it passed. And of course, 911 is available everywhere today. But uh, after it was done, I remember him coming to me and said, now we've got another project and we need to be able to set up uh, towers to collect wireless transmissions of phones and move that phone conversation from one tower to another and we need to be able to acquire easements on private property to set up these towers. And we would use this system um, to operate in cells, trans transmitting telephone calls from one cell to the next and wanted me to carry that bill. And I said, Ed, that is the craziest idea. <laughs> what are you going to call it? Well, they're going to be called cell phones. 
and uh, you know, he did get somebody else to carry it. I don't remember who, but I, I said, no, I've done enough heavy lifting for you. I'm not going to do any more for the telephone company. But they had to, they had to pass the enabling legislation to allow them to enter in agreements. To, I think he asked me if, if it would be okay to use eminent domain, and I told him no. But, but he still had to have the authority to enter into a property transaction that would give the telephone company an easement on private property, and that's... And that's the rest is history, as the thing goes. is history. What other big uh, pieces of legislative work are you most uh, uh, well uh, happy with or uh, I think most uh, significant? I, uh, I think one of the things that I authored was the uh, Kansas Comparative Negligence Act, which abolished uh, the harsh doctrine in tort law of contributory negligence. What it allowed was that uh, you could compare the negligence of, of parties and give a partial damages to somebody, even if the, if the injuries they had were partly their fault, they wouldn't be banned from, from recovering anything. They would get something uh, attributed to the, to the wrongful party. And uh, I authored that and, and got it passed, and it became a model for other, other states. It was uh, uh, the way we did it is you couldn't recover unless you were less negligent than the, than the defendant, the person you're suing. And, and that model was enacted verbatim in 17 other states. So I, I feel kind of proud of, of that piece of legislation. And I, interestingly, I was able to try one of the first comparative negligence wow. cases as a lawyer. Uh, and it was a, it was a classic case where comparative negligence was involved. It involved a, uh, uh, a highway construction worker working on a summer uh, road crew and a person going through the construction, so it's speeding through the construction uh, zone. And uh, of course my client uh, immediately told the police uh, on the police report is, I never saw the car. I, mean, I never saw what hit me. And uh, of course that meant that he wasn't looking and therefore he was negligent, but the person driving the car at a high rate of speed through a construction zone was also negligent. So we tried that case and, and uh, he was able to collect some of his damages uh, as a result. So You're also involved with uh, a number of things related to criminal law uh, while you're in the legislature. Why don't you talk about some of those? The f really kind of two pieces uh, involving firearms, both uh, firearms as, a, as an element of a crime and an early effort in Kansas to do something about uh, uh, use of uh, you know, firearms. Here, here we are, 50 years later, talking about an issue that was a problem 50 years ago. Gun violence was an issue before the legislature um, in the 1970s. And uh, I authored a couple of pieces of legislation with uh, Demo uh, some Democrat uh, from Wichita, uh, Gene Anderson on one of them, uh, Paul Feliciano on the other. Uh, to make it a bipartisan bill, uh, but uh, uh, one, one of the things that we did was to say that if you're going to use a firearm in the commission of a felony, you're going to face an automatic prison sentence. It was a mandatory prison sentence for crimes committed with a firearm. The prosecutors loved the law because they could arrest somebody, charge them with that, and then get them to plead guilty if we take the gun uh, as an element of the, of the crime out of the, the charge so that they wouldn't face uh, going to prison. And, and the defendants, if they were guilty, were much less uh, willing to go to court and actually try the case thinking they might get off. If there was any prospect that they were going to get convicted, they knew they were going to jail. So, so that law, and I think that law is still on the books, uh, but it, you know, it had mixed results whether it was really good or not. And then, then Gene Anderson and I authored a bill to ban the sale of handguns with a barrel length of less than 12 inches, thinking that handguns are not used for hunting and, and uh, we could eliminate gun violence if we just took these guns off the streets. Well, the first reaction was just the sheer introduction of the bill resulted in a run on handgun purchases. 
So it, it did, and it absolutely got nowhere. It didn't even have a hearing. And, you know, I don't think we really expected it to. We just, we just were trying to make a point uh, that we've got to do something about it. And th they were both very amateurish attempts at gun control. But, you know, here we are 50 years later, we're still trying to find a solution to that. Didn't you get sued over that? Too? We did. I got sued by the Kansas chapter of uh, the NRA. I'm sure the introduction of that bill drove up their membership and drove up their uh, political action committee fundraising dramatically because here's a couple of liberal uh, legislators trying to take your guns away. And, uh, but yeah, it, uh, it, uh, it was an amateurish attempt. <laughs> You were also uh, going from the, the macro criminal to the to the other end of things, a uh, big supporter and able to get through a small claims uh, bill to, to allow people who might have something that didn't warrant hiring a lawyer but still allow them access to the courthouse. Yeah, there, there had been attempts before, I guess. Uh, I was chairing the Judiciary Committee, uh, and we introduced it as a committee bill. It has a little more gravitas than an bill introduced by an individual, but I carried it on the floor, and it set a, a jurisdictional limit of $300. Today, I think that amount's been raised to four or 5000 yes. but, but uh, uh, it was designed to give a remedy to people that had a civil complaint, uh, oftentimes involving a faulty construction work or, or some uh, relatively small transaction that there was no no remedy for you. you couldn't uh, hire a lawyer. The lawyer fees were more than what you were wanting to recover, and this gave them a way out. It was adjudicated for a, a judge pro tem who was typically a member of the bar, just appointed for the day or the evening to hear these cases, and uh, it was relaxed rules of evidence. But it but it allowed sort of an arbitration of small claims, and, and I wrote an article for the Kansas Bar Association about it and described it, it wasn't a great academic achievement, but I described it as somebody trying to uh, peel a carrot and cutting your finger. You don't go to the doctor to solve that problem. You, and this was a remedy like that. Okay. One of the things that I know you were heavily interested in and involved with was the changeover from uh, governorship and state officers running for two-year terms to four-year terms, and following along with that, the ability of the executive branch to pull together various disparate pieces of uh, the bureaucracy and create a, a cabinet-type government. Why don't you talk about your analysis of the changes in the governor's role uh, during your time? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good point, and I think um, a lot of that should uh, we should recognize the role of the Docking family. Uh, George Docking had been governor before John Anderson was governor back in the 50s, and then his son became governor in uh, 1968, I guess. Uh, the governor served a two-year term, and at the end of that two-year term, uh, Bob Docking ran for a third term, right. and that was the campaign that you and I worked in when we graduated from college for Kent Frizzell. Uh, Docking was reelected, and then the following year he was reelected again, so he served eight years as governor. And I think there was a feeling that there needed the, the, to extend the term of office for state officers to, from two years to four years, and this would apply to the attorney general, insurance commissioner, state treasurer, all of those. Bob Bennett supported that idea, and uh, I think uh, Pete McGill supported it. Um, I don't know if he was pressured from Bennett to do it, but I'm pretty sure that Bennett and Bob Docking worked closely in restructuring this um, approach to, the, uh, to running for four-year terms. And I think it's been good for government. I think it's provided more institutional knowledge in these positions and uh, more continuity of leadership. The other, the other thing that Bennett did and, and Docking did and, and Pete McGill did 
was we started reorganizing state government and bringing together a lot of independent commissions and uh, state agencies that were operating autonomously. One of the first uh, things that was uh, established was a Department of Revenue under the direction of the governor. He appointed the Secretary of Revenue that ran the department because before that there were all these state agencies that had taxing authority, collected taxes like the uh, alcohol tax, um, there was the tobacco tax, all, all the uh, motor vehicle tax, all of these taxes were collected by separate state agencies and when they created the Department of Revenue it all fell under one taxing entity. Uh, they also um, uh, set up the Department of Corrections fairly early in the process. Uh, this I think was all done when Docking was still governor. I'm, I'm not sure but I think so. And uh, that brought all the state penitentiaries under one secretary. Before that the wardens at each uh, prison and, uh, operated autonomously. So uh, um, by the time Bennett became president of the Senate, Pete McGill became Speaker of the House in 1973 session. They created a new committee called Governmental Organization. Tony Brockie chaired it in the House, Went Winter chaired it in the Senate, and he was from Lawrence. Brockie was from a physician from the KU Med Center from Johnson County. And, uh, they worked a, a bill through to create, to consolidate the various functions of the welfare system in a, in a new agency called Social and Rehabilitation Services. And Brockie carried that bill on the floor of the House. Brockie was defeated in the next election and uh, Bob Miller was, R.H. Uh, Miller from Wellington, was named chairman to continue that process of setting up departments under the auspice of the governor's office the same way the President of the United States had a cabinet system. We were going to create a governor with a cabinet system so that he could really administer the policies of the state through his appointments. And uh, the first bill that we took up was the uh, creation of the Department of Health and Environment. Uh, we merged all those um, independent Boards, the Healing Arts Board, uh, the Mine uh, uh, Safety uh, Inspection Board was, was a separate deal. It all came under the newly created Department of Health and Environment. We also passed some conformity legislation that picked up the changes that Nixon had done for Clean, clean Air, Clean Water Acts that were passed during the Nixon administration. We, we, pass conformity legislation through that system. Uh, and uh, then the, the next year we did the Department of Transportation and that was controversial. It was the, um, the highway department was run by the uh, State Highway Commission and uh, it was somewhat controlled by the highway Contractors. <laughs> I think the old, more than somewhat. <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I think uh, I think Norm Gar <laughs> described it as a fox garden in the chicken coop, if I remember. But uh, we uh, we abolished that, set up a uh, Department of uh, Transportation with a secretary. That process continued. If, if once we did that, of course, I then the next session I became chairman of the Judiciary Committee and went off. The, governmental organization committee, but, but they continued to work and I think one of the last state institutions to be brought under that was the uh, State Board of Agriculture, which was elected by all the various farm organizations and uh, uh, they elected a secretary of agriculture. And Sam Brownback was originally secretary of agriculture before he became a congressman, a United States senator and governor. He got his political start being elected Secretary of Agriculture by all these farm organizations like the Farm Bureau, the Kansas Livestock Association, the Wheat Growers, all that. So, um, um, you know, we wanted to, to have 
that be a little more democratic system reflecting the will of the of the electorate and do that through the governor's office so we we abolished the the uh, state board of agriculture and their ability to select a secretary and allowed the governor to make that appointment which is what we have today you had a rather unique and personal experience on the, the transportation issue, um, which we could talk about we, for a long time, but can you give us kind of a, a, a I, synopsis of that whole uh, thing where you kind of uh, were involved with uh, uh, some pretty serious business? Yeah, it was a, uh, when we introduced the bill to create the Department of Transportation, we had this highway uh, uh, state inspector uh, come before the committee and said, you know, I'm a state inspector and I'm working on US 59 south of the construction of US 59 south of Lawrence. And I turn in my reports and I'm being overridden all the time uh, by the contractor. On the so state. he was kind of a whistleblower coming He in, was right? a whistleblower. And uh, we allowed him to testify before the committee and uh, to make the case that, hey, you know, really the State Highway Commission is should not be running uh, transportation issues and, and highway construction should be handled more by by the the governor's office and so we had him testify and, and he said you know basically made these allegations public it got a lot of press coverage there were TV stations coming in uh, filming him testifying and and uh, he said well these you know I can prove everything I'm saying it's all in my reports, my daily reports that are filed in the, in the Highway Commission's logbooks. And uh, about that time, Kurt Schneider, uh, who was the Attorney General, opened a criminal investigation based upon what he had heard in these uh, televised committee meetings. And uh, he went to the Highway Commission and seized the logbooks and took them into his office and said they were part of a, a uh, criminal investigation. Well, the committee wanted to see these to see if this guy was telling the truth, so we asked to see him. Long story short, uh, we didn't get to. Pete McGill wouldn't support using the legislative subpoena powers to get that stuff. Uh, so I went, to, and Kurt Schneider called me to his office and asked me, uh, wanted to ask me questions about what I knew about this. The Attorney General. The, the Attorney General. Attorney, yeah. And. Uh, so I went down there, and of course the press was following. It was uh, being written daily in, in the newspapers. And I went there and basically asked him to give us access to the logbooks. He said no. Um, I left the meeting, and uh, uh, I remember they asked me what was happened, and I said, well, the attorney general uh, will not um, turn over the logbooks that he's got in his possession. And I. I said, I, I would not want anyone to say that he is in any way influenced by the fact that his wife is a secretary working for the State Highway Commission. That would be completely inappropriate. And of course, that got in the press, too. But, but we ended up passing that. Uh, the logbooks were never made public. We don't know whether the allegations this whistleblower said were true or not. But there were issues involving pouring concrete in muddy conditions when it wouldn't set up properly and that kind of thing. But US 59 got built. Yeah, so. it did. Very nice highway. <laughs> yes. So, well, at some point you decided you'd had enough of the legislature and uh, that was in 1984 was your, your last... I, I was majority floor leader. My father, uh, by, and I'd reconciled things with my father. He was happy. I was a practicing lawyer's partner in the law firm I was with. Uh, I was in the state legislature, had been elected majority floor leader, but he called me and said, you know, I'm going to retire, and I'm going to either sell the company or I'll give it to you. And, you know, he had amassed a lot of real estate. We, we owned land in Leavenworth, Wyandotte, Johnson, Jefferson, Jackson, Shawnee, and Wabunsee counties in Kansas. He started buying citrus property in Texas, citrus orchards in the Rio Grande Valley of Texas, and had become one of the ten largest independent growers of citrus. And uh, so there was a lot of assets in this company, and I said, okay, I'm done with politics, I'll come back and 
take over the family business. <laughs> and you did. <laughs> and I did. But somewhere along the line, you got hooked up with Major League Baseball. Talk about how uh, that happened. Well, yeah, it, uh, I, you know, uh, the company was wildly successful. I mean, it was successful before I got there. It got more successful. We, uh, we sold, uh, we had sold off all the retail stores we had. We concentrated on the airline business that my father had started selling passenger service products to airlines. We had opened, we had customers worldwide, all the airlines in the United States, uh, all of the, uh, a number of airlines in Europe and Asia. We'd opened an office in Hong Kong. We had an office in Brussels. We had an office in Kansas City. And I had a depth of staff uh, r running the company for me, and I really didn't need to do much. And so uh, I'd come in one day a week and sign checks, but I was more interested in farming and ranching and stuff like that. So, uh, but I got interested in professional baseball. I played baseball in the men's senior league, won a national championship in a 30 and over hardball baseball league. So, and I played with some guys that had been professional players before. One of them was a guy by the name of Bill Kelso who played for the White Sox. He'd gone to work for the Houston Astros as a scout. And he, I said, can I follow you around, learn what you do? Um, because I'm kind of interested in being a scout. And, and uh, so I was a bird dog scout for him, no pay, just followed him around. He taught me the business, taught me the trade, how it worked. And then I, got, I applied for a job with the New York Yankees the next year and got hired as a part-time scout and covering basically the Kansas City area. And then the following year after that, I was hired as a full-time scout for the New York Mets, which I did for four years. And uh, um, the, uh, uh, the job was, uh, I, I had a big region of all, the, kind of in the Midwest, but I traveled pretty extensively, went to spring training to evaluate players. It was my ambition to become a major league general manager. I had a law degree, which was a plus. I had experience in politics, which was a plus. I had a successful business career, which was a plus. The only thing I didn't have to create the perfect resume for a general manager was I didn't have player evaluation skills. Well, I was developing that as a scout. And I, I was the first professional scout to see Albert Pujols play. He was a sophomore in high school at Fort Osage, high school in, uh, in Missouri, and uh, wrote a report, tried to get the Mets to take him when he was at Maple Woods Community College. I followed him from his sophomore year up, and I, I never really rated him as that good a player, never <laughs> any idea that he'd be uh, as good as he became, but, but uh, I did feel that he had some skills and could play at, at the professional level. So I turned in a report that we should try to take him in the fifth round He's agreed to pay to sign a contract because you didn't want to use your fifth round pick if the guy won't sign the contract. Right. So you had to get the guy to say, I'll sign if you draft me. He agreed to sign for $100,000. Fifth round came, the Mets skipped. Sixth round came, the Mets skipped. We didn't. Finally, by the 12th round, he was drafted by the St. Louis Cardinals. Mets never got him. And uh, I, I was disappointed in that. And I pointed out that, you know, this guy ended up being the, the most valuable player in the first pro league that he went to. Uh, that was an A-ball league in Iowa, I think. And uh, then there was an opening from an injury at spring training, and he got to go to spring training the next year, made the team, and was rookie of the year. And then, you know, the rest is history. Uh, became one of the greatest hitters in baseball history. But uh, he... Uh, uh, I, I signed the next year, I signed the Mets' first round draft pick because they started to pay more attention to me, I guess. <laughs> but um, uh, and that was a, a high school kid from St. Louis by the name of Bobby Keppel, who uh, never played for the Mets, but uh, played for uh, the Minnesota Twins. We would typically take our young prospects and trade them to another team for a veteran player because the Mets in New York in the market they were in, they had to win today. You know, they couldn't build build a team up. They had to, to, so they were always trading their top prospects. He went to Minnesota, played there for a few years, played one year for the Kansas City Royals, 
and then went to Japan and finished his career. But uh, I think you told me that the attacks on 9-11 changed things and absolutely. basically ended your baseball yeah, career. Yeah, it absolutely did because at the time before September the 11th, our company sold more stainless steel cutlery than anyone in the world. <laughs> We, uh, You're the we, teaspoon king. We, I, uh, yeah, I made, <laughs> made a fortune as a teaspoon salesman. But I, uh, in coach, you would get a, a, a meal served on the plane, a hot meal from Dallas to Kansas City. You got a hot meal in coach, served on a piece of porcelain. Uh, you had stainless steel, knife, fork, and spoon. Um, when 9-11 happened, they took all that stainless steel cutlery off the airplanes and put plastic because they were afraid somebody would be, use it for a weapon. And I, we had all that inventory. And, and I had to come back immediately, take over the company, negotiate with banks. We had multiple banks that were financing the company. I had to negotiate with them not to foreclose. Uh, we, we were managed to avoid bankruptcy, but uh, it was a stressful time. Well, from there, you have moved into the world of cattle and become not just a local cattle producer, but you have pioneered some things which have become international standards, including creation of a very unique uh, website that is uh, not just designed for the cattle market, but try to focus on environmental issues worldwide. Why don't you talk about your move into the cattle well, business? Well, I, I started with, uh, uh, I was a Hereford breeder. We we lived on a farm. Actually, even when I was in the legislature, we lived on one of our family farms in Jackson County, and I would commute. We had cattle there, and uh, I became a registered Hereford breeder when I graduated, or when I left the legislature in 1985. I also worked part time for the Hereford Association as their director of international activities because I was flying all over the world in the airline business. I, I have flied, uh, flown around the world 15 times. <laughs> uh, typically I would leave Kansas City, go to LA, call on customers there, go to Tokyo, end up in the office in Hong Kong where I would work for a period of time, which is kind of an interesting story. I won't try to do too many asides, but our office was in the 22nd floor of the Lippo Center. There was all kind of, they put all the American companies together and a company moved in across the, the the hall from us called Microsoft. <laughs> and of course, they, they moved out. We stayed in that same building for 35 years. We never needed a larger office. But And then I would fly on to Brussels, work there in the office in Europe, and then come back. But I, So because I was doing all this international travel, I could attend livestock fairs and things like that on behalf of the American Hereford Association. So I learned about Hereford and learned about Cattle Breed Association. So a few years later in 2004, I started my own breed of cattle called a Black Hereford. We used uh, Angus genetics to change the hair color on Hereford's black to meet market uh, demands and, uh, and, and uh, started a magazine to support it and everything else. And today it's one of the 10 largest beef breeds in the United States. We have 500 breeders in 35 states. We've sold cattle from our ranch to Hawaii, New Zealand, all over the world. We'll but talk. The, about, go ahead. But the, you were talking about the the cell phone app yes. that I developed, mm -hmm. and that that's an ongoing project. But I um, I um, developed a cell phone app that takes an autonomous picture of using the camera function of the cell phone of a bovine face. In other words, if you put a cow in front of it, it'll take a picture automatically. It won't photograph anything else. And it's like a fingerprint well, kind of with, for, the, for the cow? Yeah, it, it, we use a, a, I developed a facial, algor uh, facial recognition algorithm at the University of Leuven in Belgium, uh, did some work at Kansas State on proof, uh, proof of concept research there. I paid for that research in both universities. And we developed this algorithm. So we would take those photographs, uh, which we would uh, stamp with the date and GPS location where they were taken, and put them in a blockchain database, cloud-based blockchain database, which would be verified by 
third party in the blockchain so that it couldn't be altered. And then when, when the animal appeared somewhere else, we could photograph it and query the database and see where the animal had come from. Well, that has attracted the attention of the European Commission because they want to ban the import of beef from Brazil uh, because uh, a lot of the deforestation in the Amazon, which is what the European Commission wants to stop, is coming from areas where trees are cut down and it's used for grazing cattle. They don't want cattle coming, being imported to Europe from those areas of deforestation. They can use our cell phone app in Brazil to prove that it's coming from the savanna area of Mato Grosso del Sol or something and use that to, to be allowed to be exported. Is to. that app used in the United States too? It is. It is not as much, but it's, and it's an ongoing process. We've had difficulty with the uh, facial recognition algorithm. Uh, the, the cell phone app does not work as well on Android systems as it does on iPhones. We're still in the process of working with it, uh, but it's it's promising. And if it does result in you know stopping the deforestation in the Amazon, uh, that would be good, right? Absolutely, absolutely. So, well, aside from uh, marrying Norma, which was probably your best decision uh, that yeah. you ever made, as you look back, what do you view as uh, some of your most satisfying things that you've been able to accomplish in well, a very broad and varied uh, career. Well, let, me, let me say that, you know, marrying one of the most beautiful women on the planet was, <laughs> was helpful. Norma was Miss Kansas in 1970, and uh, when, when we were first married, she was a member of the uh, American Federation of Radio and Television Artists and doing television commercials for pretty good money. She was the national spokesman for MasterCard, doing MasterCard commercials. Holiday Inn commercials were running nationwide. She was doing grocery store ads for Superfoods, which was a West Coast grocery store. And when we would campaign in my second election, I'd only lost two precincts in my first election. After that, when Norma campaigned with me, I never lost another precinct. <laughs> and, and, did people demand that she be on the ballot well, instead of she, you? <laughs> she would go down one side of the street, I would go down the other. People would recognize her. They wouldn't have any idea who I was, and, and uh, the crowd was much uh, uh, more following her. But I, And then another thing that she was very helpful with was she became a good friend of Olivia Bennett. and uh, Governor Bennett's Governor wife. Governor Bennett's wife, and uh, she was um, elected the the president of the Legislative Wives Association when she was young. I mean, she was in her 20s. And again, these old World War II guys uh, uh, and their wives all came to Topeka together, and the wives would get together and organize stuff, and Norma was in charge of that. So when it came time for me to run for majority floor leader, she could go to these wives and say, will you support my husband? Joe. <laughs> and I defeated the incumbent majority leader by one vote, but I'm sure that that had a lot to do with it. <laughs> so you've had a long and varied career. What, what are the new challenges uh, that, that you're taking on? How, are you expanding your cattle empire? or uh, No, I pretty well turned it over to my son who runs our ranching operations in, in Pilot. My youngest daughter runs our citrus company in Texas. She's a nurse in Denver. It's a business that works very well for an absentee owner. And then my, uh, my oldest daughter and her husband run our airline equipment business. And, and uh, she has uh, developed a side business uh, that she runs through the company's books uh, on generational transfers. And she's a coach, a life coach for, for people that... Um, go into family businesses and some of the unique challenges of doing that. But uh, The one thing I don't think we've covered, and I'd, maybe we can close on this, is you got this close to running for United States Senator from well, Kansas. I, you want to talk about I, that? I don't know that I want to talk about this if we have time, but, <laughs> but I, I, I was very upset about the decision to go to war in Iraq. I knew that was wrong. I knew the difference between a Sunni and a Shia. I had been doing business in the Middle East for our airline company. We had contracts with Royal Jordanian, El Al, Saudi Airlines, 
uh, Kuwait Airlines, Qatar, United Emir Emirates, the um, Emirates Airlines in Dubai. Um, and I knew, even Morocco, we were doing some business. I'd never been to Libya, I'd never been to uh, Iraq, I'd never been to Iran. But I knew that it didn't make sense that Iraq was involved in that. And all this discussion of weapons of mass destruction didn't ring true to me. I, I, don't, I didn't believe it. Of course, there were inspectors there. And I remember I was at an airline meeting in Portugal, and we, I, was, I had a guy working for me that lived in Lebanon, spoke Arabic, and he was my sales guy in the Middle East. And we were talking to the director of purchasing from Saudi yeah. Airlines, and uh, he, uh, he said, uh, I'm really worried that George Bush is going to invade Iraq. And I said, no way. He's not going to do that. He's just using it to get inspectors in there to look for weapons of mass destruction just to make sure that there aren't any. But he will never invade. Oh, I think he's going to. I said, no, he's a lot smarter than that. Well, he did invade. And, of course, the whole auspice for the invasion turned out to be false. The yellow cake uranium was not true. Uh, uh, um, Valerie Plain had come forth with her uh, revelations about the intelligence that was done. And Pat Roberts was the, was the chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee. He should have been the guy that rolled that back. Uh, he didn't. Uh, I was very motivated to run against him. I spoke at the state uh, Democratic Convention uh, shortly after, in 2004, I guess, the invasion was in 2003 saying that this is wrong, that I was changing parties, becoming a Democrat, I didn't want to be a Republican, uh, because we were going to war again for the wrong reasons, like uh, Johnson had done with the Gulf of Tonkin during Vietnam, uh, Bush had uh, done the same thing with, with Iraq and weapons of mass destruction. And uh, I remember uh, Kathleen Sebelius, but... Uh, Dennis Langley, in particular, trying to convince me to run for the United States Senate. And uh, so I, I gave it some thought. I remember going to Wichita, and I, this is a long story. We, you may not want to hear it all, but I went to Wichita, spoke to the Wichita uh, Democratic Party about the same thing. Uh, Vern Miller was there. Jim Lawing was there, who was a legislator with me. Vern Miller had been Attorney General, a Democrat Attorney General from, from Wichita. And uh, they were uh, great applause, standing ovation, you know, yeah, go, go run. And so I came, we drove back on the turnpike and I told my wife, I think I'm, let's, let's do this, let's run. So uh, I got a call from Chuck Schumer, who was, was running the Senate uh, uh, campaign committee for the Democrats and said, let's, let me help you. He said, I, I said, can you put any of your own money in the campaign? I said, I'll put a million dollars of my own money in the campaign, but uh, you know how much can you raise for me? And he and so he said, "Let me let me see." And uh, a few weeks later, we were in Belgium, and I got a call from Schumer saying, "I want you to come to Washington and meet with Harry Reid, who was the majority leader of the uh, uh, the Senate and the head of the Democratic Party." And so I hopped on a plane from Brussels, flew to Washington along with Norma, and we went in for a fireside chat just like this in his office. And uh, I said, uh, uh, we're going to need some support. And he said, well, I, I'll throw fundraisers for you in Los Angeles, Miami, New York, and we'll, you, you will have enough money to, to launch a campaign. I said, well, what about talking about this issue of why we're in Iraq? Why, why are we tiptoeing around the fact that the Republicans lied to us about why we're going to war in Iraq? And he said, well, a lot of our members support the war. And I said, well, but how can they deny that this, is, uh, this, this happened? And the Democrats need to talk about that more than you're talking about it now. He said, well, we have a lot of friends that support the war and support our candidates. And I said, well, what, what, do you, what do you mean, friends? And it occurred to me, oh, you're talking about the defense contractors. And I asked him. And he said, you have to take the money that we raise for you and make that an issue in your own campaign. 
And I said, well, if the Democrats aren't willing to make it an issue at the national level, then what I do in Kansas isn't going to matter. So I, I decided then not to run. But I was reminded of the, of the closing comments of another Kansan, Dwight Eisenhower, in his final speech to the nation when he said, beware of the military-industrial complex. In many ways, we fight wars in this country because it's good for business. Well, and, and every congressional district has some defense presence, too, with, with a lot of jobs, yeah, which, yeah, is, uh, which is certainly true in Kansas. So, so. Well, I think we've about, uh, is there anything else you want to comment no, on? I one think of, I've gone on. Well, the, the one thing I would ask you, you seem to me to have embraced bipartisanship in your legislative career and uh, that seems to be absent today. Would you comment on the need for bipartisanship and the willing to, to sit down with other, other folks? There, there have always been fractions in the legislature, rural urban splits. Uh, Pete McGill, who I certainly disagreed with at the time. Well, and, it was the reason for yellow. And didn't, didn't <laughs> want him to get a third term. But he taught me you never make an enemy in politics. The person that you're opposed to one day is your friend tomorrow. And he was like that with me when I was chairman of judiciary, when I was majority floor leader. He was very helpful in, in teaching me things that I needed to do to run that committee, to, to be a leader in the party. Um, but yes, we worked across uh, lines uh, in some of this uh, gun control uh, uh, proposals, uh, uh, co-authoring a bill with, uh, with Gene Anderson, who was a black Democrat from Wichita. Very liberal. Arrow space industry and a Republican conservative, I thought it was conservative uh, at the time, in, from Johnson County, very heavily Republican area. Uh, but we, you know, we tried to solve problems uh, uh, and make things uh, nonpartisan if we possibly could. Well, I think that's a good note to close on because yeah. uh, um, I think we need bipartisanship and certainly you're uh, you've given us a role model, uh, although we have to dig back 50 years to find it. It'll take, this is for the, uh, for the historical record. That's right. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Joe. Thank you.